of their religion. Did, how many people know that there were how many official religions? Thirteen? Were there thirteen or ten? At least in the, in the early colonies, at least thirteen. Oh, out of the thirteen colonies, nine official. Nine official. How many people would believe that there were official religions? Nine official state religions. Had you ever been taught that? They were state religions. So if you went to one state, the official religion was this. You go to another state, the official religion was that. And the founders fought that. That was constitutional, yeah. right? It was constitutional. You constitutional. Bet. You could do it at the state level. The federal government could not. I really think their, their genius was it have provided an escape valve. For instance, I don't care if Massachusetts wants to do universal health care. Do it. You want to destroy the state, you can destroy the state. I'll move. Business will move. That's you'll right. learn your lesson That's and right. it'll repair itself. But the federal government can't do it because there's no place to escape to. So they, what they did is they fought. They all believed in God. But well, uh, Thomas Paine is kind of up in the air. Well, he believed in God. He didn't believe in Christianity. Okay. He, he said, I'm going to stand before God and answer to him for what I do. So I he believed in God. I think there was a time period at least that he was. He was pretty he was, God hostile. He, yeah. he did not like the fruits of the people Correct. he saw believe so, in God. So um, here's, well, stand in line on that. <laughs> exactly. Um, the, 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 the idea was is that they would go and they would fight for another religion in court. They would stand up yeah. and say, you have a right. They have a right. I'm not a member of their religion. And that's where we've gotten lost as a country. We think that we have to impose our views on someone else. Look, I am not, uh, I'm a Christian. I'm not offended by the menorah. Is anybody offended by the yeah. menorah? You want to have the menorah up? I think that's great. I teach my kids mm -hmm. about the, the festival of lights, but I think it's, I think it's good. Where the hostility comes is from people who are trying to jam it down somebody else's throat. My religion or the highway? No, you can say whatever you want. You can do whatever you want, but I also have the right to do it. Um, and and the, uh, the other hostility comes from people who say, no God. But that goes against the principles of our country. Because if there is no God that hands out rights, who grants you your rights? Let me read you, uh, let me just quote you a quote inside the Jefferson Memorial. Came from the first book Jefferson did. Thomas Jefferson said, Can the liberties of a nation be thought secure if we remove their only firm basis? According to Thomas Jefferson, the only firm basis of national liberties, he said, is a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God and they're not to be violated but with his wrath. If you ever lost the concept of God, you lose the concept of inalienable rights, right. of well, you, limited government, of everything else. Well, again, I just ask you this, America. Just ask, ask this one question. If God is erased, who issues right. rights to man? That's right. Back in a minute. We're restoring um, history with an audience of teenagers aged 13, 19. Uh, they're from high school through college from all over the country. We have them from Connecticut. Anybody from Maine? Nobody from Maine. Uh, we've got a moose in the, in the green room. Uh, and all the way to um, California. All, also, we have David Barton of Wall Builders here with me. And where did we leave off? Tiffany, where do we go next? Um, Kelly. Where's Kelly? Hi, Kelly. How old are you? I'm 15. You're 15 years old. What's your question? Um, well, I know that in school we've learned how the Founding Fathers had to take great risks for the independent America, and they often put their lives on the lines. And I was wondering if you feel that politicians today would be willing to do the same for America. Um, I think there are some. Um, I know that I have actually spoken to some. Um, Michelle Bachman, I don't think she would mind me saying. I have spoken to Michelle Bachman, and um, you know her. Mm -hmm. You know her well. She's a very spiritual, religious she woman. Is. And um, she has not, we haven't talked about life, but she knows that she's in the crosshairs, and she knows that she is the biggest target, and she will stand, and she's not going to sit down. Um, I can't speak for a lot of the politicians, because I don't have a lot of contact with them. I kind of like to, it's kind of like a quarantine. <laughs> and um, uh, the one thing that I have met with is, and this has very, been very, very hopeful to me, I have in the last six months met with people in business, and I mean people who run large corporations, 
people who are worth tons of money, um, people who are just very stoic and, you know, they're successful. And, and uh, I have stood with them and, you know, you know I cry a lot, right? Yeah. Um, I've stood with these people and not cried and had them cry and say, I will lose every dime. I will lose my life. I'll lose my house. I will lose everything I have if the republic can be preserved for my children or my grandchildren. I will tell you that there are a ton of people that are starting to stand up and um, they're willing to do the right thing. You know, I, I talked the other day about a, a, a book that I'm, I'm writing and I don't know when it will come out, um, but it's called God, Blessing and Curse. And the blessing is once you know God, he, sky's the limit. I didn't know God and I was a miserable human being and I changed my life in 2000 and I went from not being able to be hired anywhere to where I am today but more importantly I went from suicidal to genuinely happy. Um, that's the blessing of knowing God. The curse is once you know Him and once you know what He's done for you when he asks you to stand, and I think this is where the founders were. When he asks you to stand, you don't have a choice. That's right. You have to stand. And there's tons of those people. A lot of them just don't know it yet. Yeah. Back in a second. David, we're just challenging each other. I just said, David, do you have an answer for something? And he said, yeah. And, and Aaron, our floor manager, said he has an answer to everything. Really? Oh, we're going to find out. I'm, I'm going to have him back and we're going to challenge him. Um, let me go to, it's Stephen, right? Stephen, your question. Do the Freemasons influence George Washington and do they still have an influence to this day? Freemasons had an influence on George Washington, but not what we think of today. There's a big difference between the two. Freemasonry today is not what it was at the time of Washington. It's introduced in America in 1734. Washington entered into what were called field lodges, which was the only way in the British military that officers and common guys could meet together. So it doesn't have the rituals or oaths or anything else that's common today. Uh, actually, by 1799, it began to change. Washington was dead then. 1813, it moved into wait, what's wait, called... Wait, 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 I've seen a painting of, of George Washington laying the cornerstone. He was wearing the apron and you everything bet. else. Why? What do you mean there was no The painting oaths? was done in 1976. That painting was done. What? Yep, the one in the Capitol of Washington standing there laying the cornerstone. Now, there were some done in the 1840s and 50s. And here's I believe I've seen his apron in Mount Vernon. Oh, he has an apron. Right. But he would not allow himself to be painted as a mason. One guy tried to paint him. He said, no way. Okay. It, because but if he had the apron, part of his he life. had the, the rituals. Uh, no, because the rituals didn't come in until much later. 1825 is when the rituals appeared. So there, there were three simple degrees, no oaths, no rituals, whatever. That came in about 1813 with what's called speculative masonry. May I ask, I, I've always thought that the, the role that um, masons played in the, in the declaration or in the revolution and the forming of our nation was the, the honor of it as it was understood back then, that um, you had a place to where you could go and speak privately, openly, mm -hmm. and no one would violate the secrecy. That was more European than it was American. That was the European model, but it was not the American model, and that was the way they hid from monarchs in Europe. The American model, I mean, you spoke your piece straight out anyway. Uh, it was not a problem, and you'll find that most of the Americans, founding fathers who became Masons, did so as British citizens, and so it wasn't that big a deal for them. Washington records in his last two years in talking about masonry that it was a very small influence in his life. Uh, he maybe attended 10, 12 lodge meetings over 40 years. The Illuminati is going to off him. In oh, yeah. They, they hate this. <laughs> All right, back in just a second. We have, uh, we have been uh, real blessed to have uh, so many teenagers here that are, are um, you know, uh, just a great cross-section of America. There is hope for America. Thank you for coming. Thank you for watching. From New York, good night.